In this video, we're going to take a look at energy flow and ecosystems. So by the end of this video, you're going to be able to define and identify terms related to food chains and food webs, as well as explain how the flow of energy contributes to dynamic equilibrium within ecosystems. So let's first start off by reminding ourselves, where does energy come from? Well, it comes from the sun. So the source of all energy for living organisms is the sun. And the producers or plants need energy from the sun in order to undergo photosynthesis, which then creates the chemical energy that the rest of our organisms consumes. So what happens to this energy in an ecosystem? Well, we can use what we call a food chain to see how energy moves and is used in an ecosystem. I think it's really important to point out here that energy is lost as we go up a food chain. And as it moves, it moves through our producers or our plants. And then it moves next through our prey. And finally, it moves through our predators. So let's take a look at um, a food chain here. We've got one that goes from plants to the mouse, to the snake, and then finally to the owl. And so the way we draw out and use food chains is we use these arrows here, these arrows, to show the flow of energy in a food chain. So the energy is going from the plant to the mouse, then from the mouse to the snake, and then from the snake to the owl. In a food chain, we also have producers and consumers. So I think it's important for us to go through these terms because I have thrown them out here a couple of times. So let's start with producers. Producers are our plants. These are the organisms that carry out photosynthesis. And they're very important to ecosystems because they bring the sun's energy into our biological systems by converting it into chemical energy. Uh, consumers, we have quite a few different types. So let's go through the types. Consumers, in general, are organisms that eat other organisms in order to obtain energy. They cannot produce their own food. So that's really important to uh, make sure that you understand. We have a bunch of different types. So there are herbivores which only consume producers or plants like our antelope here. We also have carnivores, which consume only meat. So our lion is a great example. We have scavengers, which are carnivores that eat the remains of dead animals. So something like a vulture would be a scavenger. We also have omnivores, which are consumers that eat both animals and plants. So a squirrel is a great example of that. And finally, and I have trouble saying this word, so I'm going to try it. Detritivores are a type of decomposer that feeds on the remains of dead organisms and animal waste. So these are all your gross little creepy crawlies like earthworms or maggots. Now, consumers can be labeled as primary, secondary, or tertiary, and they're related to our energy pyramid. So primary con consumers are the ones that eat producers. So they are our herbivores. So in our energy pyramid, we've got our producers at the bottom, and then our herbivores are our primary consumers, which come next. Secondary consumers then feed on primary consumers, so they're typically carnivores or omnivores, and they come the next level higher in our energy pyramid. And finally, we have tertiary consumers, which feed on our secondary consumers. They're usually a carnivore, so they are at the top of our pyramid here. Now, we can label them primary, secondary, tertiary. We also have another term called trophic levels, which help us understand the feeding level that we're at um, where an organism exists. And so those are called trophic levels. Our producers 
are at trophic level one. Our primary consumers are at level two, secondary consumers at level three, and our tertiary consumers are at trophic level four. Okay, so it's just another way to classify what level these organisms are at. Okay, so let's practice labeling a food chain. What I'd like you to do is pause the video and decide which of these organisms is the producer, primary, secondary, and tertiary consumer. And then also see if you can label the organisms as herbivores, omnivores, or carnivores, as well as the trophic levels. So pause the video here, and then we'll come back when you're ready for the answer. Okay, so let's quickly go through this example. Our grasses are our producer because they undergo photosynthesis, so that would be a trophic level one. Our cricket is our primary consumer, which is a herbivore because it eats only the grass. That's a trophic level two. The bird is our secondary consumer because it eats the crickets. And birds can either be carnivores or omnivores. That would be trophic level three. And finally, our snake is our tertiary consumer. Usually they're carnivores, and that would be trophic level four. So we did say energy is lost as we go up a food chain or as we go up the energy pyramid. There's actually something called the 10% rule, which applies here. And so only 10% of the energy in an organism is stored and passed on to the next trophic level. So if we look and producers have a thousand kilocalories, then 10% of that for primary consumers is only hundred. 10% of that in secondary consumers is only 10 and tertiary consumers, 10% of that is only one. So 90% of the energy then for each level is used to live. And so we can see that the amount of energy available, uh, from the producers and consumers contains um, as energy flows through the ecosystem in the energy pyramid here. And we, we saw that as I just described. All right, at each trophic level, 90% of the energy is used up or lost. So 60% of that is energy that passes through in its waste. And 30% is used in cellular processes. That leaves only 10% to make body tissues and um, also get passed on to what the animal eats. So if we look at our producer, 90% lost, only 10% passed on. And that continues through the primary consumer, through the secondary consumer, and so on. So can you think of why a food chain cannot have more than five trophic levels? Pause the video here. Think about it. And then when you're ready, let's move on. So food chains are limited. And the more trophic levels between producers and top carnivores in an ecosystem, the less energy that's left from the original amount provided by the producers. So you can see in this diagram here, by the time we get to the top, there's only 10 joules of energy left. And so food chains are quite limited in that you can't really have any more than about five trophic levels, because by the time you get to the fifth trophic level, the amount of energy there is so little that there's so little to pass on. And then that organism would not have the energy to be able to do the processes that they need to be able to do. One last term we need to define is a food chain versus a food web. And so a food web is different from a food chain because it's a series of interconnected food chains. It shows us uh, the different connections so we can actually predict the impact of a species being removed or added to this ecosystem. Arrows are gonna indicate the direction of energy flow again. So that is similar to a food chain. And it shows all the possible pathways the energy can go. So for example, if we go from grass, it could go to the rabbits, 
mouse or the grasshoppers. And then from the rabbits, it could go to the foxes, it could go to the hawks, and so on. So I'm going to leave you with one question here. What impact do you think uh, decreasing the po rabbit population would have? Okay, so think about that. And um, I'm going to leave you here in this video. Let's move on to the next task.